Today I'm going to talk to you guys about momentum. Momentum is actually the right side of this formula that you've seen before. Uh, this is the impulse momentum theorem. Uh, so on the left side, as you've seen, we have this thing called impulse. And impulse is really a factor of the amount of force that's applied, and it's actually a net force, multiplied by the time that it's applied. And so together, those two things make up this concept of impulse. And that impulse is equal to the amount that the object changes its momentum. And so this um, is actually a change in momentum. Now I know this is weird, but the idea of momentum right there, um, we couldn't really use an M to signify momentum. So you're not going to see that in there. We have to use a different letter because M is already taken. And in fact, both little m and capital M are both used for mass in physics. Uh, so we have to use a different letter. And uh, the best way that we can do it is to go back in history and see what else momentum has been called. And Newton called the momentum impetus. Um, and so we're going to use the P from impetus to be able to uh, signify that. And so delta P is the change in momentum. And so it's how much the momentum changes. Uh, you guys know the word momentum, um, and you know from probably sports. So for example, if a team seems like everything is going well for them and they can't do anything wrong, they have the momentum. Um, so it's difficult to change their direction um, they can't, even if they make a mistake, if they have the momentum, they keep going in the same direction towards winning. Um, and so in that respect, this is kind of a similar concept. It's actually uh, for objects, for big real world things, um, it's actually a little bit easier to understand, I think. So I'm going to give you two examples here. Uh, so let's imagine for a moment that you have a little toy train that's driving along and it has a velocity of 2 meters per second. And we're going to compare that with a real train. And the real train also has a velocity of 2 meters per second. Now what you can say is the difference between these two is not the velocities, of course, but their masses. And so if this one has a mass of 1 kilogram, this one has a mass of 1,000 kilograms. You can see that they're very different. Um, now, for a mass of 1,000 kilograms and a mass of 1 kilogram, <clears throat> you can start to think about what that implies about their motion. Mass, as you might recall, is the determining factor for an object's inertia. And inertia is the resistance to a change in motion. And so let's imagine for a moment that you would like to uh, get in front of each of these and try to stop them. So you're going to apply a force to each of these to try to stop them uh, in their motion, to try to take that velocity down to zero. Now, immediately, uh, you think about the fact that this toy train is going to be easier to stop and this real train is going to be almost impossible to stop. What's the difference between the two? Well, we already determined that it's the mass that's the difference between the two. And so as a result, uh, there must be some concept that has to do with the mass when you try to change the motion of an object. And so this concept, as we're going to see, is momentum. And so momentum must be equal to the mass and something else. So it has to have it, uh, it has to include mass in there. And we're going to abbreviate that as P equals M, and then there must be something else that's in there, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, so the mass makes a big difference. Uh, what other thing could happen here is, let's say, um, instead, we have a toy train that's going two meters per second, and then we have another toy train like so. But this time the toy train, in addition to having a mass that's the same, has a velocity 
that is much bigger. So let's say 200 meters per second. So which one is going to be more difficult to stop? Uh, the toy train with a velocity of 2 meters per second or the toy train with a velocity of 200 meters per second. I think you can see that it would be much more difficult to stop this train than that train. And so as a result, we know that we must have uh, velocity as a part of this equation as well. And so P equals mv. And so here's uh, our formula for momentum. The momentum, P, is equal to the mass times the velocity. So now we have this concept of momentum, which uh, is the product of the mass and the velocity. Now, just to kind of, uh, something that you're going to have to keep in mind as we go through this is that velocity is a vector. And anytime you have, well, almost anytime you have a scalar times a vector, right? A number without a direction times a number with a direction, your result is going to have a direction. And so momentum is a vector. And we're going to have to kind of keep that in mind here that this is a vector here and this is a vector here because those two are vectors. So we're going to come back to that in a week or so. Anyway, um, going back to our original impulse momentum theorem, the momentum right here is actually the change in momentum, as I've written before. The change in momentum is the mass times the change in velocity. Typically in problems, the mass doesn't change much. Now, there is a, a side note I just want to point out here that if you're firing off rockets, rockets burn fuel and they burn fuel fairly quickly and so their mass changes quite a bit. And so as the mass changes and the velocity changes then you get a lot more variable issues and it's much better to use calculus. So for the most part we're going to imagine that the mass is a constant for all of the objects that we're dealing with. So if the mass is a constant for all of these objects then the only thing that changes really is the velocity. And so we have m times v2 minus v1 is the spelled out version of the change in momentum. So if momentum is equal to the mass times the velocity and we have m times the quantity v2 minus v1, you can see that I can distribute through the mass and so I end up having um, m uh, times v2 minus m times v1. Now if you know momentum is mass times velocity, here's mass times velocity, here's mass times velocity, so really we have momentum 2 minus momentum 1, which is another way of saying delta P. And so that's where that comes from right there, is that um, the mass times the change in the velocity actually come, becomes the delta P, because that's what that, uh, that's what that stands for. Uh, so the delta P, this change in momentum, is equivalent to the impulse. And so if you know how much impulse is applied to something, you know how much the momentum is changed. And this is a critical part, in fact, I think the most critical part of this entire unit is that an impulse changes momentum. If you can figure it out, then it works. Here's a quick example. Um, when I, if I were in a car accident, my speed would go from a high number, like let's say 20 meters per second down to zero. Um, my mass wouldn't change, hopefully. Um, and so my, my change in momentum would be my mass, which let's assume is, two, is 100 kilograms, which it's not, but let's just assume it. 100 kilograms times a change from uh, 20 meters per second down to zero, so that's a negative 20. So my momentum changes as a result of this car accident by one, 100 times negative 20, or negative 2,000 uh, kilogram meters per second, which are the units for momentum kilogram meters per second. No fancy units for that one. So uh, negative 2,000 uh, kilogram meters per second is my change in momentum. How much impulse did I have? I must have had negative 2,000 Newton seconds. And so then I can use that to try to figure out how much force had to be applied to change my momentum if I know how much time it took to apply that force. From some, uh, someone who's been in a car accident before, I want my time to be as long as possible because the bigger this number is, the smaller that one has to be to make the total two, negative 2,000 uh, Newton seconds. And so most safety equipment, football helmets, airbags, seat belts, uh, front end crumple zones, um, pads for, for uh, sports, all of those things, they don't change uh, directly change how much force you feel, 
they directly change the time that it takes uh, to apply that force. And so that by making this bigger, they are able to make the force smaller and keep you safe. And that's the idea. Um, nothing changes how much your momentum changes. That, that is what it is. What is different, though, is uh, how much time it takes to apply that force. And so if you spread that force over a longer period of time, you can get the same momentum change with a much lower force. And so that's what keeps you safe. Hopefully this makes sense. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks for watching.